Hello everybody, it is me, Lizzie Bean, with Stitch People. I am recording my first floss tube video uh, and I'm going to make a pattern because it makes me laugh. <laughs> so I thought, what better thing to do for my very first video than make a pattern and maybe even stitch it if we have the time. I posted to Instagram, ooh, what is it, two nights now, and I was making chicken parmesan and I don't want anybody to get any ideas. I go, I love to cook. Here's the thing, I love cooking. I actually, for a brief time, wanted to go to culinary school. When I was younger, I would come home from school, this is like high school, and I would watch Food Network. I love Rachel Ray, I have a bunch of cookbooks. I went through a big phase of it and I really enjoy it. I find it very relaxing and fun. Uh, but with life, it's not something that I think about much or do to a great extent these days. I like to get better at it because I, I really do enjoy it. But anywho, so, I had like, you know, pre-made pasta, you buy it in a bag. I had pre-made sauce that I got from Costco that's really good. I'd recommend it if I could remember the name. And I actually bought, there's a grocery store just down the street called Harmon's. It's a great grocery store. For those of you East Coasters, it's kind of like a Wegmans. It's not as good as Wegmans. Uh, it's kind of like a Hannaford for those of you New Englanders. But I just bought like pre-done chicken parm from Harmons. And it's really good. I totally recommend it. But I decided to make a quick Instagram video while I was prepping some food. I was like, hey, how's your week? How's it going? I'm just making some chicken parm. Just want to see what questions I can answer for you all. And somebody asked, do you have a chicken parm pattern? I was like, oh man, we should. And then I thought, oh man, we should. Why don't I make a chicken parm pattern? So that's what I'm doing today. <laughs> And you can kind of see how I think through designs and how I make stuff go. I hope that's interesting for you. So let me switch over to my screen. And I'm down here at, in the side. I don't, I think I just like mirror flipped or something like that. I'm still working on my setup here. But let me make a chicken parm pattern. Why the heck not? I use Adobe Illustrator to design my patterns. This is just because I know it because of my background as a graphic designer and as far as making patterns goes using illustrator feeds well into adobe indesign which is a great program for compositing books or patterns or pattern books pattern collections so it's just the pattern it's the program that i've continued to use because i i know it and i'm familiar with it and it it works really well for uh, you know making books out of it so i i don't i i have played with Mac Stitch. I have Mac Stitch on my computer and I like it, but it just doesn't translate as well for when we're making you all new books and patterns. So I'm just doing my thing here. I'm just going to make a little self portrait of me and some chicky parm. <laughs> it just makes me delighted. It always makes me think of Parks and Recreation, the TV show. I don't know if you all know that one or watch that one but tom haverford they're ordering food and he asks leslie nope can i order apps and zerts and then they cut to this interview of him talking about all the things all the words he uses to describe other things that already have a name <laughs> and he says for chicken parmesan i call it chicky chicky parm parm and it just makes me laugh. What's funny is I don't even eat chicken parm all that much. Because uh, I'm one of those people where gluten is not great for me. And so I tend to avoid it. So at restaurants or whatever. Oh my goodness. Have you been able to see this this whole time? I don't think you have. I'm so sorry. Well, I've got a little face here and... <laughs> heard my story of, of woe not my story of woe just my chicky parm story what's so funny is this is my first like not live video I'm always live with everybody and so I can look at comments and chat with you live it's weird to be chatting with myself with my by myself all alone in the world with the anticipation of you watching it in the future I don't know <laughs> so first I'm just starting with a little stitch person I know my hairline looks wackadoosville wackadoodle dandy um I'll fix that we're just getting the basic outline here 
I tend to go one, two, three, four squares above the eyes for hair. And, and I don't know if I'll stitch this cross stitch or if I'll do the real hair techniques. I'll probably just cross stitch it. What does my hair look like? I need to look, oh, I've got it like pulled halfway up. That would be an easier effect if I'm doing the real hair. I, I will stitch, I like to still design my stuff as though I'm cross stitching it um, just to make sure that it kind of works and looks right. So let me make a burst. So I'm wearing a sweater that is cream and orange and mauve. So I'll do that. Make a little cream color top here. It goes into a, goes across my shoulders. And I guess it doesn't have a turtleneck, so. Let's see. I don't, I don't have a super long neck either, so. Goes across and then it does go here and then this goes mauve which is like pinkish it's fun looking at the screen I can kind of see the color picker is in the general or you know because my sleeve is right here and I can just go right into the color picker we're we're pretty close here I think there's a little more blue in what I'm wearing so just pull that color down and choose a mauve there we go. This uh, outfit probably won't translate well into the pattern that I've got in my head. I'll scooch down so you can see my sleeves because I sort of envision something a little different. So I'm going to remove my arms and I'm going to make myself just a table <laughs> a table to sit at I'm just counting one two three on either side I wish I was better at <laughs> at multitasking here it's sometimes it's hard to talk and design at the same time so I'm just gonna where's my hair just uh just coming down around my shoulders these days. I definitely have experienced hair growing out because of COVID time. I'm gonna give myself just a little curl. A little wave. Yeah, that's nice. It's generous. That's very generous for my hair. <laughs> what would it look like if I scooched it in? Yeah, maybe I'll do that. Obviously, off my face here. Oops. Get that off of my face. Get that off of my face. And then I'll scooch that side in as well. And fix it. Oops. Didn't mean to jump her all around. There we go. Yeah, that's all right. I'm just exploring what like what it looks like to have a, because if you leave a stitch out here or there, it gives kind of the illusion of a little bit of curl happening. So yeah, maybe maybe something like this. We'll see. And again, this is just thinking about if I'm gonna cross stitch it. Yeah, that's, that's closer. Now I'm getting wide again. I don't know. I don't want to spend too much time on the hair. Some days it's curly. Some days it's straight. A straight hairstyle is easier to do. And so I'm just going to do that <laughs> and get it off my shoulders. I've got some, uh, like overlaid squares there. 
All righty. So now I need some chicky parm. And I'm actually like the idea of me ravenously eating it. So I'm going to do my arms like this. <laughs> and I hope, forgive my light set up here. It's so that when I start stitching, it's really bright and clear. But I'm going to hold my arms up like this. So I'm just doing this and looking at myself in the camera because I want to make sure that my that my arms follow a similar angle, what's appropriate. I also realized I gave myself a super long neck after saying I didn't want to do that. So what's interesting is we are releasing a collection of arm and leg poses soon in February is the idea. So it'll be easier for everybody to design unique arm and leg, you know, um, poses, I hope. I hope it'll become easier for you all. Yeah, that's cute. And now I'm going to just flip this. I copy it and flip. I'm not sure if that's the right placement. Let me see what's going on with the hair here. So this comes in like that. Yep, there we go. Cute. Okay, cool. And then I'm going to give myself just a little like fork and knife. <laughs> just to celebrate my victory over the chicken parm. And then I'm going to put my chicken parm here on the table. I'm gonna move it down one more. Just I, I'm not sure about the spacing here. Let me make sure you can see this. There we go. And I'm going to I'm just gonna zoom in on the plate here, or where I'm gonna be putting the plate. There we go. I'm gonna make myself a big cheeky parm. <laughs> I hope you've all had a good day. It's been an interesting start of 2022 for me. Um, Spencer and I both got pretty sick. What's funny is we were exposed to uh, some family over the holidays that was tested positive for COVID like two days after we had spent time with them. Even though, you know, we're all, regardless of your beliefs on it all or whatever, but we, we all have been vaccinated, whatever. So they, they all, some some of them came down with it. And we tested negative and didn't have it. And then like a week later, we got sick. And, and we didn't test the second time because all of the symptoms aligned. And in Utah, actually, the tests are running low in the state right now. And so the, I can't think of her name, the health person for the state of Utah has recommended, if you think you have it, you probably do. You know, if your symptoms align, it's safe to say you have it. And let's not overwhelm the hospitals right now and use up all the tests, you know, unless you're really dire, like unless you really need to. So anyway, so we honored that and did not go get tested because I don't see how we couldn't have it at this point, especially because Omicron seems to be, I don't know if that's how you say it, but it seems to be quite intense <laughs> and everywhere. <laughs> so Anyway, um, I'm just kind of making some spaghetti. This I'll probably freehand a little bit, embroidery style. Just a big plate of spaghetti. Why not? And then chicken parm. What would I do for like a chicken breast on top of this? I think if I just alluded to, <laughs> let me pull up. I wonder if I could pull up a parm chicken parm there we go chicken parm so we're just got like a breaded tan situation with some marinara so let's do a breaded situation a lot of the magic of this will happen i think with uh stitching it I'll stitch on some little breadcrumbs and <laughs> it'll be really fun. 
And yeah, there we go. Okay, I don't want it to be the same color as the table though. So I'm actually gonna change my table. Let's give ourselves a nice like antique brown. Again, when I stitch it, it'll look different than my hair. Okay, so we'll just do a couple of stitches to look like chicken parm. And, uh, and then I'll do some marinara strokes here. <laughs> this is so funny. I love it. And I'll just put them on my pattern to remind myself to do them. And then I'll, I'll do a couple, uh, I'm just going to use white because it'll be easy to see. And I'm going to just do a couple of French knots on top of this for like breading, cheese, whatever we want. Sprinkles of Parmesan. <laughs> so there is my chicken parm pattern. <laughs> so let's stitch it. Why not? Why the heck not? So I'm gonna switch to...
switch to my camera because I'm not stitching right now. I'm taking a little sip of a drink. Anyway, as you can see, I get really excited about puzzles as much as I do about cross stitching. And I, I would love to have a show about, about it to talk about why it's important to continue the tradition of hand cut wooden jigsaw puzzles. Why is it important to have people who, you know, brick masons and home-based artisans, cabinetry, woodwork, you know, those beautiful intricate ceilings of yesteryear. Who are the people who make those today? I'm fascinated by it and I'd love to maybe invite like famous co-hosts for each episode and we go around and talk about something that interests them or or that they know about and and just have, you know, some sort of educational element too where there's classes that you can take if you're interested in stained glass or woodworking or whatever it is the episode is about. Maybe there's a podcast that goes along with it so you can get even more in the nitty gritty. But that's my dream. We actually, we filmed a sizzle reel. Has it been recording? This is recording. This is recording. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> I've been stitching for like an hour and a half. And I don't think you had any of it recorded. <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, you live and learn. <laughs> Happy floss tube, everybody. I don't know what to do. Do I backtrack and just repeat myself and tell you all the things I've been talking about for the last hour? I talked about my degree. I've talked about having vocal troubles. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pause and check it out. Indeed, I stitched for an hour and my microphone wasn't on. So I'm going to go back and edit that and just speed it right on up with a little PSA. And now, as I continue to stitch my chicky chicky parm parm, I will regale you with all the stories that I already regaled you with that weren't recorded into the ether. <laughs> this, is live, this is Live and Learn 101. You are on this journey with me. And I'm going to pose this. I'm going to still pose this floss tube. <laughs> this is exactly why I've been nervous and hesitant to get into all these new things because there's so many moving pieces. For this to look good, I have a whole setup. I've got a mirror up there with a camera pointing at it. I've got a light on my face. I've got these lights that are helping to light my stitching. I have to make sure that when I'm stitching, I'm in view here, that I'm not moving around too much. I gotta make sure my microphone's hooked up. I've got my video camera with the stitching. I've got my face camera. Friends, there is just a lot going on. <laughs> So anyway, it's funny to me that uh, that the microphone, alas, the most interesting part other than stitching was not was not rolling. So cheers to learning together and to moving forward. <laughs> All righty, I'm thinking about it. What I'm going to do is I'll show you my screen again. I'm gonna pick out my brown hues. Oh, I'll pick out all my hues, actually. So what does my hair look like? That's pretty good for my hair, right? We'll do that for my hair. Maybe give myself a little highlight. Nope, those are both 938. 898, that's not super different. 801. Yeah, that's nice. We'll do a little combo of that for my hairs. And then, We'll do, I'll switch to my stitching screen. So I need hair, I need chicken parm, I need a plate, and I need a table. So I've got my hair here. Chicken parm, I'll do like that. It would make sense to do a, a bit of a combination. Maybe that'll be my chicken parm. And then my table, what should I do for my table? 
167. That's a little bit grayer. I could do I could do kind of like a gray table. This is the fun part about Stitch People is we have a very dark wooden table of our own. It's kind of antique. Maybe that reddish reddish brown would be good or like a golden brown. I could do like a blonde gold table, but I also need to pick out my spaghetti. Maybe that that's a good spaghetti color. Maybe even a little lighter. That'd be a good spaghetti color. No, that's too tan. Do a little bit of this yellow for spaghetti with my chicken parm. And then table, table, table. Maybe this, maybe this one, this one's different enough. Or, or I could do this 38, 62. That's, that's a nice neutral brown. It's very different from those brown hair hues. It's, it's a lot lighter and then it's a lot grayer than these chicken parm hues. So I think I'll use that as my table. So we've got hair, table, and then spaghetti and parm. Oh, I do want, we'll do some of like, I've got a lighter and then a, this for like breadcrumbs and cheese. No, a cheese is not bright white, is it? That would look really freaky. We'll do some light colors here. Maybe for like breadcrumbs and stuff, we'll do a little combo. And then we need some red marinara sauce. Let's see. We could just go red, red. That's very vivid. I, won't, I don't want it to pop out too much. Here we go. Don't want to pop it out too much from the rest of my portrait. So, looks like I'm getting low on this, buddy, but I think 310 might be the answer. Oh, and then I need eyeballs and a mouth. So, oh gosh, there's my 310. Don't have a lot of that in my 3712. I think I'll fill those in right away because I don't like to be faceless. I'll wait on the hair just because I'm more excited to, well, no, I, if I'm honest, I like to save the best for last when I stitch so that when I'm done with like the fun thing, it's like, ta-da, it's all finished. So, oh, and I also wanted to do utensils. So I'll get out like a nice, we use dark gray for utensils so they show up nice. So that said, I think I will finish the eyes and the lips and the hairs. I'll do the utensils, I'll do the table, and then I'll do the chicken farm, because that's fun. So it looks like I need to replenish my DMC 310 here. It's just looking outside, because I feel like this is looking very shadowy, um, but... The sun is still out. It's only early afternoon. Well, late afternoon, early, getting to be early evening, 4, 4.23 p.m. It's nice. I, I am starting to notice that the days are starting to feel ever so slightly longer, which is a welcome change. A welcome, welcome change indeed. You know what I'm going to do, actually? Might as well for y'all to see. I'm going to adjust my lighting, see if it helps. If I bring this down. Well, no, I don't like that. Maybe we just need it to be a little bit more above. There we go. Does that help? That helps a little bit. I mean, if it could be above, above, that'd be great, but then it would cover it up. So we can't quite do that. And we can't quite cover up the Kimba. There we go. That's a little better, maybe. And if we bring this one a little bit closer, <laughs> and then I'll scooch my body. <laughs> I look all freaky in the in the light here, but 
It'll be easier for me to stitch and I think a little bit easier for everybody to see, so I don't mind that I look like a spooky story right now. Like, Are You Afraid of the Dark? Anybody watch that Nickelodeon in the 90s? I mean, that stuff gave me nightmares as a kid. Nightmares. I was very impressionable. I used to also get nightmares from watching Law & Order, SVU. Love, I love uh, Olivia Benson. I love Stabler. But boy, boy, they, those cases freaked me out as a kid. I've since become, you know, a jaded and cold-hearted adult. And no longer am scared by Law & Order. But I don't like horror movies. I don't watch a lot of horror movies. I don't watch any horror movies, to be honest. Uh, I'm just not, not a fan. Life's, for me, life's too short. Like, why choose to be afraid? That's, but a lot of people, like, I, I, I mean, like, I, many of you know, I'm into film and TV. I have a lot of friends in that industry, and I've had some really good discussions with why people like horror. A lot of people like to face their fear and process their fear with horror movies and give themselves a specifically safe venue to to be afraid and to get comfortable with facing fear and overcoming some some of those things so like I, I, I get it in theory I still prefer to watch Seinfeld <laughs> um, I like to laugh I like I like feeling joy and happiness when possible I do I do know that I tend to avoid big emotions so I mean I that's part of it uh, fear being one of them. But that's, it's not an entirely bad trait. I mean, it, because I'm able, I, I don't know why, I just learned to kind of push through fear and it's why I am able to try new things and take a lot of risks. Because uh, I don't stop to think about it being, a, being scary. Because <laughs> I do not like to feel those feelings. <laughs> it's like Lizzie exposed, Lizzie therapy 101, but it's true. It's true. I'm like that person that makes jokes at inopportune moments because like, I'll just try and lighten the mood. Uh, it's not always appropriate. And I know that it's just, I, it's a total, it, it, it's not a total coping mechanism. There is an element of that in there for sure. But it's also like, um, it's also a practicality thing for me because like, uh, you know, if we're sad, if we're afraid, if whatever, like, Life is, like, the world is still spinning. Life is still moving on. So, like, yeah, I need to feel my feelings and process them. And, you know, I, I'm working on that. But also, you know, if I'm one of those people who, like, makes a joke at a funeral or whatever, you know, the cliche is, it's also in an effort to, like, uh, e ease tension and, and, and uplift people and maybe make it, it's an effort to make something, like, slightly easier if I could provide a comedic relief or something, then we can take a breath and... Because, again, like, the the world is still spinning. We're, we still have to wake up in the morning and, and do what we got to do. And so if I can provide a laugh or a relief to make the going on just even a hair easier, that's often where, you know, where it comes from. It's an attempt to just, like, just provide some kind of relief because we still got to move forward, you know, it's, it's hard, life's hard, life's a, life's a whole thing, but it's not an ignorance, there's no ignorance about it, it's definitely, I'm aware of how I am, and who I am, and, uh, and a lot of it is just, just me being authentic, and me do, you know, doing my best, trying to be helpful, and good, and I don't want to, uh, you know, there's a difference between trying to provide a little comic relief and, and, and being in denial about a, a situation. It's, uh, it's interesting. I'm reading this book right now. Spencer and I are both reading it. It's called Good to Great. And it's about what makes... Uh, let's see. This one's going to be my knife. So I'm going to make the top here. I'm just going to do two parallel stitches so that it's a little thicker. So it looks like, you know, a knife. It's a little thicker at the top. And then you hold it at the bottom. Anyway, Good to Great is about what makes what's the difference between a good company and a great company. And it's a really interesting book. And one of the things it talks about is accepting reality as it is. And he talked about how there's a, he, I can't think of his name, but there's a man who survived as a prisoner of war in World War II for like 
seven years this man was a prisoner of war. And, and a lot of people died as prisoners of war. A lot of people didn't make it because they, they kind of ran out of steam, ran out of hope. And what's interesting is this guy attributes it to... Uh, there's been research done that says like the, the optimistic guys who became prisoners of war actually became depressed and kind of burnt out faster um, versus the guys who kind of accepted reality. And this guy who, who was the prisoner of war who, who lived to tell the tale kind of said that it's it takes, he attributes his survival of this to like a faith and a hope and and it's, I guess a sense of optimism in some ways that like it would work out that he would be able to get free at some point tempered with an acceptance and, and a rea of, of the reality of the situation uh, so that it's the to be able to endure something like that is really a matter of being able to be both hopeful and realistic and, and that really resonated with me because I think that's a lot of people mistake my optimism for ignorance I think and it like it isn't it's purposeful optimism it's it's a hope it's a faith it's a hoping for the best wishing for the best making all efforts for the best but also life is really hard <laughs> that's a that's a fact and and it's okay it's okay that it's hard you know it has to be okay because it is what it is um so anyway I don't know that's that's quite a tangent isn't it uh so here we go I've got a little fork I've got a little knife I've got eyeballs and a happy face. I'm going to combine my DMC 938 and 801 and stitch my hair. And I'll tell you some of the things <laughs> that I've already told you that weren't recorded on my microphone earlier. <laughs> uh, I talked about chicken parm. I talked about how I liked to cook as a kid. I enjoyed watching the Food Network in middle school and high school. I cooked a lot in high school. I briefly thought about going to culinary school because I enjoy it so much. But with life and work, it's not something that I really do much of these days, for better or for worse. And so the other day, when I was making chicken parm on Instagram and asking everybody what your questions are, what we, you know, what do you want to talk about, what patterns are you looking for, that kind of stuff, I was like, I'm just making chicken parm, thought I'd say hi. And people were saying, oh, do you have a chicken parm pattern? And I was like, that'd be fun. <laughs> so here I am making one. But uh, as I was stitching, I was talking about my grandma and how she had a number of Italian friends because she was, I believe, engaged to, at some point, an Italian man. I could have been, instead of Lizzie Debchinsky, I could have been Lizzie with an Italian last name. And uh, he, he unfortunately was killed in World War II. He was a pilot and his plane was shot down. And it's funny, I, I kind of knew this vaguely as a kid because this man's sister was my mom's maid of honor, or I'm sorry, my grandma's maid of honor at her wedding to to my grandpa, my, my dad's parents. And, you know, she stayed in good touch with this family, of course. And I, I just, the older I got, and, you know, when I was dating and falling in love and getting engaged and getting married, I, man, my heart just broke for my grandma and it really... It really makes me sad to think of her going through that. And, and you know, you never know people's stories unless you ask, I guess. But just a lot of uh, compassion for my, my sweet Grammy who, who has gone through so much and you wouldn't even know it. Um, it's crazy. But anyway, she had this beautiful friend. I remember thinking as a child how beautiful this woman was. Her name was Maria. And she taught our family how to make the most delicious meatballs. And the trick was mushing all the ingredients together using your hands. <laughs> so the meatballs, it's very basic. I remember I have the recipe somewhere, but the meatballs, it's, you know, ground beef, I think some ground pork, I think uh, breadcrumbs, some Parmesan cheese, some eggs, and some spices. I, I truly think that might be it. And you pour it all in a bowl or dump it all in a bowl. And then you squish it together with your hands until it's really, really well mixed together. And she, Maria said that that's the trick. That's what makes the meatballs so good is mixing it together by hand. Of course, you wash your hands ahead of time. Like it's not, it's not gross. 
if I mean it is a, a little bit if you're not used to cooking that way I remember the first time I did it I was like really aren't there germs I'm like yes yes there are that's why you wash your hands um and then you cook the meatballs in the sauce the sauce is like you do up some onions and garlic and herbs and then dump in some cans of crushed tomatoes and get that nice and hot and then you make the meatballs with your hands and you drop the meatballs right in the sauce and you let it cook for like three hours or something like that and that's how the what is it low and slow you cook it low and slow and that's how the meatballs are cooked and oh my gosh what a spaghetti and meatball time I'm one of those people who's gluten sensitive I don't have celiac disease I have some family members who do and there is quite a difference between being allergic to gluten to having celiac disease which is close to being allergic to gluten and to being gluten sensitive where it just makes you swollen and bloated and gassy <laughs> that's what I get <laughs> yay uh, but it's also dairy and cane sugar and some beans I, I had this big big allergy panel done a few years back and then I was off of all of those things and I was really good about it for a year I did not eat gluten or cane sugar or eggs or dairy sesame seeds blueberries cranberries green beans there was a few other things that I tested sensitive to and uh, essentially I was working with a doctor who does this on the regular and she said you know you go off these foods for a long time your digestive tract can heal and then oftentimes if you can give it long enough like a year you can heal to the point where you can reintroduce these things into your diet and your body can actually do a better job of digesting them because you're not um, you're not uh, causing further damage you know by having damaged intestinal tract and then continuing to eat foods that continue to damage it it never gives you time to like catch up so I gave myself a good long time to catch up and I can eat some of these things now but the reason I'm telling you this is because I have heard and I have read in articles and such that um, <laughs> that going to Italy a lot of times people who are gluten sensitive can actually participate in the food culture there that because Italy or Europe in general doesn't use wheat products that have like so many GMOs and are so genetically modified and scienced away that our bodies can actually digest it better. And that is a theory I would really like to test, I'll be honest. I talk about it in the upcoming Stitch People episode with Annie. And I apologize, Annie. I never did double check with you how to say your last name because I just, we just jumped into first names and called it a day. It's A-B-A-T-E, Abate or Abate. I think it's, I think I know an Abate or Abbott um, who pronounces it that way. Anyway, she talks about how she'd like to go to Italy and we reminisce about vacationing <laughs> back in the day of, of that pre-COVID. And uh, it got me thinking about Stanley Tucci's show. He's got this docu-series called Searching for Italy with Stanley Tucci. And he goes around the various regions of Italy and, and eats and he talks to the farmers and the chefs and the restaurateurs and locals about various foods from various parts of Italy and the stories behind them and, you know, why the geography of certain areas makes the prosciutto extra good there or the balsamic vinegar or the cheese or, you know, whatever it is that he's learning about. It is a great series. If you're at all interested in Italy or food or docu-series or Stanley Tucci, <laughs> I highly recommend it. Uh, one of the reasons Spencer and I are watching it is because it is my dream to have a show. And I actually have a concept for a show. If any of you have seen the Stanley Tucci show or if you've seen, um, if you've seen Down to Earth with Zac Efron, so he, he goes around the world and talks to people who are doing interesting things with sustainable energy solutions and, and green, green energy solutions and, you know, environmentally friendly stuff. Uh, it's a really great show. I'm not even like a huge, huge Zac Efron fan. I, I think he's talented. I've seen him in some things, but uh, he hosts the show really well and they go around the world. It's really fun, really interesting. And that show and Stanley Tucci show are kind of the models for the show I would like to do someday. I'd love to host a show. That's like my capital, capital, capital D dream. 
and I want to do the crafting version. So like Zac Efron did the sustainable green clean energy version. Stanley Tucci's doing the food version. I want to do the hand making version because it is a subject that really fascinates me. I mean, clearly here I am stitching a portrait. I love making things with my own hands. I love being inspired by people in the Stitch People community about what you all do and come up with. And Spencer and I, a couple years ago, acquired another small business. It's called the Waterford Puzzle Company. And it's a cute story how it came about. The owner, Fred, he was running the company because his wife started this puzzle business back in the late 80s. And she unfortunately passed away in 2008. And he kept it running. Her husband kept it running. And at age 90 or 91, he now has, this was back in 2018, he found a new girlfriend. She's 84. And they want to start their lives together. And he wanted to kind of get out of the puzzle business and didn't know how. So my aunt knew that Spencer and I were small business people and small crafty business people. And anyway, we worked it out to, to acquire the business so that we could keep it running and my aunt could keep her job and, you know, the other puzzle cutters. And they do hand cut wooden jigsaw puzzles. And I'm so in awe of it. They use scroll saws and they cut by hand without using any templates or guides. They're not, they just do it free, freehand, freehand puzzle cutting. Their brains just work like this, where they can create jigsaw puzzles out of thin air. <laughs> and it is amazing to do a puzzle cut by a human and not by a machine. Um, and it's different even too than people who design puzzles like digitally. It's its a, its, its own thing. You could, the, It is its, an art form. It is an art form. And the type, and the, and the puzzles are, different they're more challenging they're more interesting they're more fun and you can almost feel the puzzle cutter you know playing a little joke on you or making making you have to work a little harder in a certain section like it, it just it's like a conversation it, it's amazing what what these puzzle cutters can do and I want to learn more about it I want to learn what what people can make with their hands and I want to learn the traditions behind it because I've learned a lot about jigsaw puzzles more than I ever thought that I would. Same thing with cross-stitching. I've learned a lot about cross-stitching more than I ever thought I would. And I'm fascinated by it. And, and, and in our Amazon world where we have like two-day shipping and everything is cheap and easy and free, there's no quality. There's no craftsmanship. And so I'm really just curious to explore human creativity, human craftsmanship, the traditions of crafting. Uh, this, is, this, is my, this is my hope. We, I put together a, a small team back in August and we did some interviews. You know, I had camera guy, sound guy, director, the whole, the whole thing. And we filmed for a day some, some concepts of this and we're going to be uh, shopping it around. I, I hope we can get it picked up. I'd love to, my ideal version would be that like we have a, you know, for lack of a better word, like a celebrity co-host for every episode. Because that's what makes the Stanley Tucci show fun, is people know Stanley Tucci. <laughs> you know, they like him. Other than the Stitch People community, not a, lot, not a lot of people know me. And that's okay. So let's bring, let's bring Stanley Tucci along and go to Italy and talk about not just the food, but we'll talk about the, you know, there's a, don't they make those masks in Italy and the uh, painting and terracotta and you know there's a lot that goes on in Italy craftsmanship wise Italian cars for example uh, lots we could talk about and I, I would love to have a co-host for every episode that somebody cares about like Tan France or something we could talk about the, the craftsmanship of clothes of fashion of hand making costumes and and just you know, cl clothing in general and why it's important, what the difference is between handmade and machine made clothes and why it's worth the time and the weight and the price and the fit and all of that. You know, I, I'm just curious about it. So anyway, all of that to say chicken parm, <laughs> Italian meatball recipe, visiting Italy, eating around Italy, Stanley Tucci with his show, Zac Efron with his show. I want to have a show like that. There's the thread of how we got to where we are. <laughs> So here's little Lizzie with a fork and a knife. Now I'm going to make the table. What is that? Tiny little nothing piece of thread. 
make a quick table and um, then we'll get to the chicken parm, the chicken parmesan. I love chicken parm. One of the other subjects I talk about ad nauseum that didn't get picked up by the microphone because I hadn't turned it on in my recording is my voice. I talked for a while and uh, told you all, and I'll tell you again, because I do need something to talk about. Well, hey, where, first of all, I need to think about this. Counted cross-stitch is sometimes hard for me. So under my hair, I'm going to go one, two, three, one, two, three, four squares down from my hair. So that's one, two, three, four squares. One, two, three, and then the table's under that. So a table starts here. That makes sense. There's my plate, and that's where the spaghetti will go. Uh, so I'm going to just actually start right here because I know this is a table row, and then we'll go out and down and back on over. Makes sense to me. Just stick with me, friends, and uh, I just realized this camera's all wackadoo. That's a little better. <laughs> I'll just see in the tip of my head. See, we're just learning together. Floss tube number one. Um... Anyway, I studied music in college. I played trombone. I did trombone performance for my first year. Thought I wanted to be a professional musician. And that, that lasted. I still thought that. But all the practice time was hard for me. I, I'm a very social person. And it also just felt like, you know, in the world, I how, you know, there's starving children in other, you know, in our own country and in other countries, like, how do I justify just spending time by myself in a practice room? No judgment for people who do. Lots of respect for people who do. I just got stir crazy and I wanted to, like, work with people more than just me and my instrument, right? So, I, actually, you know what? I don't, I'm changing my mind. I'm looking at my pattern here. I don't want those little legs. I designed it with little legs like that. I don't like it because it looks like a weird little mini table. So, I don't. I don't want a mini table. I just want the surface. Um, anyway, so I changed my emphasis from trombone performance to uh, media music studies was the name of my program at the time. Now it is called commercial music, which is way more apt. It's, um, I learned how to do film scoring for movies and write music for commercials and record music and do songwriting. It was just a commercial music more degree. And I learned to sing better. I've always been a singer. My mom's a singer. My family's a very musical family. My sister sings. And um, then in 2017, I got, I joke, I got the kitis. I got bronchitis real bad and coughed my voice away. And I did not realize how much of my identity was wrapped up in singing until I couldn't anymore. My goodness, I've got a knot the size of Texas. And I don't know how it happened. Little loopy knot. There we go. Anyway, so you can probably hear a little bit of raggediness in my voice. That is because I've had a cold. Maybe even Omicron COVID. Um, Spencer and I have both been sick for like the last 10 days. <laughs> it's been, it hit us hard. It has been the symptoms of COVID. So we are fairly certain that it's COVID. Uh, we have not been tested because Utah is low on tests and our health person, official Utah health code, whatever. They kind of said like, Omicron is raging. If you feel you have it, like if your symptoms match, you probably have it act like you have it, you know, stay home, don't go out, don't see people, hide away if you can, <laughs> which Spencer and I have very willingly done, and and we've gotten better, but I definitely got it, I've, I've had a bad cough, which really stinks, because after all these years, I finally started back in August, I saw an ENT at the time, at ear, nose, throat doctor, for my voice, back in 2017, 2018, and I did a vocal rest, and I was on steroids, and um, it helped, but anyway, it just, it was hard, and I kind of relearned to use my voice because it, it was damaged. I, I got into some bad habits that continue to keep it from getting better. 
year after year and, it, and it's been very emotionally taxing that I've been kind of in denial about it. I haven't wanted to put in the work because it's hard to have to relearn from scratch something you used to do really, really well. So anyway, I finally got my act together <laughs> and back in August started working with a voice therapist again and an ENT and I've been really good about my vocal warm-ups. My I have uh, speech related warm-ups and I have singing related warm-ups. I like to do them in the shower because it's nice and humid. I think, let's see, where does this go? One more. Um, but then I've been like noticing my register getting a little bit higher if you watch old Stitch People videos, my voice is way higher. It's crazy. Not only is the production quality cuckoo bonkers, but so is my voice. And I've been improving and I've been getting really excited about it. And then we got COVID <laughs> and I coughed away my voice again. <laughs> so two steps forward, one step back, I guess. But now I know how to get back on track with it and I will. And, um, Let's see, what color do I want? I'll do a white. I have white dishes, so I'll do a white plate. Yeah, is that? Yeah, that's, that'll be fine. Do I have any white in my little pile of scraps? Sometimes I keep around a little pile of scraps. I don't know if anybody else does that. Like, all these will go in here because it's like, they're not, they're perfectly fine. And they're colors I use a lot. I probably should have pulled my eyes and lips and hair from this little scraps pile. Doesn't look like I have any white. So I will stick this back in here, do a quick cleanup of my flossies. I reorganized this recently. So I will do a gift to my future self by maintaining it for a while. 938, 801, I think it's right here, okay. So anyway, yeah, just a little anecdote about me and my horse voice it is what it is. I used to be a um, pretty naturally high soprano. I actually uh, used to have a three to four octave range naturally, which is pretty good. And I could, oh, I could sing so high. Not really these days. It's definitely helped my alto. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Alrighty, so we are getting to the end of this chicky parm pattern, and I'm excited. Well, not to the end. We're getting to the chicky parm part of the pattern, which is exciting. So I'm going to stitch my plate here and I did an extra you'll see uh, compared to the pattern I did one more row of sweater just so that if any sweater shows and I actually only did I did full stitches on the outsides and then little half stitches just so that there's some of that blue sweater color in there and then if there's any sweater showing beneath the spaghetti noodles then it won't be white, it'll be blue, like the sweater. Just a little preventative measure there. So this white plate, I'll probably outline it. Probably should have chosen a gray, because white on white is hard, but Kind of like the idea of everything popping against the white plate. White floss on white Ada is a bit of a tricky conundrum that crops up. You've got like a little white dog that you're stitching in a portrait. Or a wedding dress, but you still want like a crispy white background. 
it's a whole thing. I always recommend one thread of like ecru or light, light gray to highlight that up. I'm gonna wait and see. Oh, look, I didn't match my plate up. I'm just gonna slide under there and give myself one more width of the plate. Because it is white, this mistake will blend away. It will be hardly noticeable. And there we go. Perfect. Okay, so I'll do that. And now I'm going to go through my some trash. I'm going to go through my little <laughs> refuse pile here and look for a light light gray or an ecru that might be yeah that'll look like the spaghetti though let me do the spaghetti first and if i need to outline the plate i might here's one thread of gray it's a bit of a dark gray but that might that might be the solution so i'll pull that out just in case but without further ado let's make the spaghetti I'm gonna use little yellow noodles and I'm gonna do, hmm, do I want just like one? Yeah, I'll just do one thread at a time. I'm gonna just do some like long embroidery kind of. So I'm really just gonna free freehand it is what I'm gonna do. So let's see. Alrighty, so I'm just gonna look at my pattern there and I'm gonna just make a little pile of spaghetti hold the tail just kind of work up and over see this is the thing is when I stitch I really concentrate and it's weird to not have like a chat it's weird to not even have Spencer here usually I have somebody else to talk to so to just be sitting here alone, I mean, I have a little puppy over there and a little puppy over there. I have two of them in here. I talked about them earlier too when the microphone was off. I was talking about how when you're stitching, I, I tend to stitch slowly because I like to make sure that I'm being careful, you know, just ultimately. And I was talking about getting your threads next to each other nicely. And it was making me laugh because Spencer and I joke that the dogs, the doggies like are next to. We joke that next to is a place you can be like, I'm going to New York City or I'm going to next to because the doggies love to come like snuggle right up close to us. So it'll be like, oh, Spence, it looks like Lucy's really wanting to get into your next to. <laughs> or get into, get into your under. That's another one. Like if you're on the sofa or in bed. And they, you know, they come up and they nose at the blanket. Like, oh, Pepper wants your under. Pepper wants to go and go, go to your under. Anyway, so with cross stitching, you want to make sure all the diagonals are going the same way. And you want to make sure that they're all appropriately next to and you're not catching the threads of existing stitching when you're using a whole of the Ada fabric in which stitching already exists you see sometimes if you're having that trouble it helps to like go in from above with your needle kind of clear up clear up your path makes it easier to bring your needle up and through how you might need to I'm gonna try something what if I bring my needle up and make like a big old uh, lazy daisy Kind of tuck it into the other side to make it look kind of loopy. Yeah, it's a little bit loopy because you can kind of tell that there's one big thread there. Yeah, I like that. I'm gonna make. I'm gonna do a couple more lazy daisies just to so that the spaghetti noodles aren't just like back and forth but that there's a little bit of like roundness to them because the way they lay in a pot or on a plate is all squiggly and loopy. They don't just lay 
straight in the bag. I mean, they only lay straight like in the bag. No, they don't lay straight like that in on your plate. Spaghet, spaghet, spaghetti. Meatballs would be really easy, just big old French knots. Another interesting Lizzie factoid, not a lot of people know, unless you know me personally, is uh, I don't eat a ton of red meat. I'm not against it. I, I There are a lot of reasons people don't eat meat generally, but I, uh, it's, it, it's kind of wasted on me. Cows growing up were my favorite animal. And I always had this cognitive dissonance about cows that I loved and I love to cuddle and pet at any opportunity <laughs> versus hamburgers. And, uh, anyway, into adulthood, like I, I just, I understand why people like hamburgers and beef and steak and stuff. And I, I, Spencer might order a steak, you know, from a place and he'll ha I'll have a bite if it's really good. And it's like, oh yeah, I, I get why that's good. But otherwise, like I, I just, it's not that I don't like it. I just don't appreciate it enough to justify like the cost and the participation kind of in the industry at large. I wish, I just wish that like, if we're going to eat animals, we should treat them nice. They deserve a good existence too. So anyway, maybe, especially with all the research about how like, you know, pigs are as smart as dogs or whatever. And it's like, well, I sleep, I sleep with some four-legged creatures and I, I eat other ones. Ooh. But I do eat chicken and fish and stuff. Try and do grass-fed stuff when I can. I'm a person, unfortunately, whose body really thrives on protein. So... That's just a, just a fact. There's biology happening that I understand and appreciate. Again, like no judgment either way. I get I get why people have ethical feelings about meat and humane feelings about meat, and I also understand barbecue culture. <laughs> you know. Alrighty, we've got some nice pasta happening. I feel great about where that spaghetti is. Alrighty, let's do our chicky parm. Let me see first if I have any colors in here that would work for my chicky parm. That is just a nothing. Cool, cool. I don't really have any light. Oh, that could work. If I do that light color light brown plus it's like a medium there's kind of another medium tone similar to what I've picked out it's kind of a golden tone that I like that's nice yeah we'll just do a little combination there and then I don't have to start any new threads here. So let's take one of each of these. And we'll make just a couple little cross stitches. Actually, I think I'll do some satin stitches for the chicken parm. Oh, those spaghetti noodles look so cute. Yeah, the white dish on second thought was probably not the smartest. Let me see if I can zoom in real close for you to see how cute these pasta noodles look. 
Like, could you die? Look how cute that is. So, so cute. There we go. So now, let me do... Now the marinara is also going to be satin stitch. So maybe I will, maybe I will cross stitch. I'll just do, I'll do it exactly like I did in my pattern. Oh wow, these are different lengths. Let me fix that. Good chow. See, I'm concentrating again. Just real quiet. Can't help it. Can't help it. Okay, so it looked like on my pattern, it's just a shame to cover up all these cute little spaghetti noodles. So we've got a nice chicken parm. Just kind of some cross stitching. There we go. And then I'll do some marinara and some cheese. And let's see if we have any red. I could use. Looks like no. It's pretty dark red. Yeah, I need a, I need a marinara red. DMC 310, which I'm also out of. Oh no, 310 is black. I must have reused that card. How funny. So I'm going to do two threads just so the red isn't overwhelming. And we'll add some pasta sauce to this chicken parm. And again, I'm just sort of freehanding this, this sauce part. So I'm gonna go right on top of my little chicken parm for sure. And it can go on to the spaghetti noodles, I think. Sort of laying on top here. Yeah, that's cute. I'm going to fluff the noodles out a little. And I'll just do another couple stitches of red. I think we've got kind of the, the vibe here. And I'll put a little bit of red in, in the sauce, like as if it's dripped down a little. On top of that chicken parm. Chicky chicky parm parm. So cute. So good. Love it. And now I'm just going to do some chase. I don't know why that quote from Elf just came into my mind. You smell like beef and cheese. Probably because I said the word cheese. <laughs> Let's do... Oh, where did that... I had a little gray thread that I was going to use to outline the... the 
plate. I think I threw it away. I shall retrieve it. And because I want, like I said, I like to have my best for last. So if, if I'm on to just like the cheese, onto the final touches, then I don't want to have to go back and outline my plate again. So I'm going to just quick outline my plate so that my final touches on the chicken parm, some tiny little sprinkles of cheese, etc., will be my final stitches. I'm going to just go all the way along the bottom, do some quick back stitching. There we go, cute little plate outlined. A little easier to see now. And then I'm just going to take one thread of, let me see which I like better, 822 or this unidentified one. I like 822 for a little bit of cheese or breadcrumbs or something. What I'm gonna do is do just a, single thread and I'm going to just loop that thread around the back a couple times that's I find for anyone who struggles with French knots I find that's really key is making sure that you have a lot of tension to work with from the start so see I can lift this entire portrait just on this one thread alone because it's nice and tight in there so now I can come up to the top of my pattern to pull my needle through. Make sure, again, you've got it nice and tight. Hold the thread with your left hand. Twist it two times around your needle. Keep hold of it and put the needle back very close to where you came up. You don't want to use the same hole because a tiny knot could pull right through. And then I like to like be able to like dosi -si do my tension between my right and left hand. I don't let go until the very last minute. And then I let go and I've got a nice little French knot. And you can barely see it, but that's honestly kind of the point. So I'm just going to go around the top of this little dish of chicken parm and make a bunch of real nice delicate French knots. to act as my cheese, sprinkled, sprinkled Parmesan cheese. Whether you're using the grated cheese or the kind of shredded cheese, I think I would still recommend little French knots because just for the texture of it. Uh -oh. I lost my flowers. There we go. Mm. Let me thread my needle. This is looking so cute. I can't deal with how cute this looks. Da 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 chicken parm, chicken parm with some Parmesan cheese. I love it so. I think this might be my last French knot. So 
I don't want to overdo it. There we go. Okay, one more. So I said, I think it might be my last French knot. I know I'm approaching the end here. Yep, that's pretty darn cute. I could use one more little sprinkle of cheese over here. Oh, my friends, I love it. I think it's so adorable. And thus, you have from pattern to stitch, a chicky chicky parm parm. Wrong way. There we go. Ta da! How cute is that? How cute is that? I love it! Well, my friends, thank you for joining me on my first ever floss tube. We're going to be doing a whole bunch of things. Some will be long, some will be short, some will be overviews of the books, some will be reviews of products, and some will be designing and stitching things together. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it was fun for you. It's fun for me. Like I said, it's hard when I don't have a chat and I don't have people to talk to and ask questions to and bounce ideas off of. So it just makes me all the more grateful for when we have live events and for how active so many of you are in the chat, in the live events. Please never stop. Please never, ever, ever stop chatting in the chats. <laughs> so anyway, hope you all have a wonderful day. Go make some chicken parm or chicken meatballs. Check out Stanley Tucci's show and hopefully someday the Stitch People show <laughs> of a similar nature. Anyway, thanks so much everybody. Have a good one.